Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Francine Hippolyte, and I am one of the obstetrics and gynecology attendings at Northwell uh, and a member of the Katz Institute for Women's Health. So today I would like to uh, focus our attention on uh, really preconceptual counseling and what that means for a woman in reproductive age before reproductive age and even beyond as far as maintaining good health and understanding what factors can impact her uh, life and safety and um, healthy health during pregnancy. So let me define obstetrics. So obstetrics is a branch of medicine and surgery that's con concerned with childbirth and the care of women given birth. Gynecology, which is the other half of what I do is the branch of physiology and medicine, which deals with the functions and diseases specific to women and girls, especially those affecting the reproductive organs and systems. So together, these branches play an important role in preparing for pregnancy and ultimately helping a woman and her family have a safe and healthy pregnancy. So I always tell my patients whenever there's an inquiry of, you know, getting pregnant, uh, that pregnancy planning conception and conception is far more than that biological clock that we're always thinking about. It's emotional, financial, spiritual for some, and definitely physical. And one would want all of these things to align well to really be able to achieve that safe and happy and desired pregnancy. So there are so many factors involved in obtaining this goal, but my role is to emphasize the importance of medical and physical aspects that can and should be optimized prior to pregnancy. So I would like to focus on the importance of preconceptual counseling. So what is that? The goal of preconception and preconception care and counseling is the education about health, education that leads to, promote, to promotion of good health, assessing a woman's risk and what the risk factors that women may come to prior to pregnant, being pregnant, and intervening when possible on these risks before pregnancy to reduce the chances of poor outcomes for pregnancy and for birth of the babies or babies. It is not a single medical visit. Rather, it's a continuum. It's something that from the very first encounter, whether the patient is in puberty or beyond, um, it's something that's very important to incorporate into every medical decision and treatment recommendations for these girls and women to help with preconception care. So let's start with some basics. The, these are some things that many women are often aware of before visiting the OBGYN. So um, basically women come in and especially those who are planning for pregnancy, they're aware of needing to take vitamins, primarily folic acid supplements. The importance of folic acid supplementation is that it reduces the risk of neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are birth defects of the brain, spine, and spinal cord. They happen in the first month of pregnancy. Unfortunately, this is often before a woman even knows that she is pregnant. So there's always this emphasis of taking these folic acid supplements for this primary reason. Another thing that many women may not think about is the importance of updating appropriate immunizations. So some of these immunizations might include the MMR, which is measles, mump and, mumps, and rubella vaccine, the varicella vaccine, which is essentially the chickenpox vaccine, and especially important in our current times, the COVID-19 vaccine, of which three are available and are recommended at any time before pregnancy, once age appropriate, and during pregnancy. So these are safe vaccines that can help minimize risks to both mom and baby. So this is something that should be discussed and reviewed at these visits as well with the OBGYN. 
Another aspect is the review of medications. So medications themselves may have teratogenic effects that basically disturb the development of an embryo or fetus. When many women may not think of the different medications that they're on and that there are sometimes prescription medications, but oftentimes non-prescription medications, over-the-counter medications that may have these negative impacts on pregnancy and on the fetus. And therefore these should be reviewed prior to conceiving with your doctor. Then there's the importance of screening for infections. Um, I think many women are aware that that is part of the routine annual visit or routine visits with the OBGYN reviewing for infections. But the importance is that um, the, some of these infections, most of them which are sexually transmitted might affect fertility and affect pregnancy outcome. In 2019, there was data from the US CDC or Centers for Disease Control that showed that STD rates in the United States has hit a new high again for the sixth straight year. And it looks like it was trending in that direction for 2020 as well. There are nearly or more than actually 2.5 million Americans that had an infection of chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis, diseases that were almost eradicated a few decades ago. The highest increase was actually syphilis infection among our newborns, which nearly quadrupled between 2015 and 2019. So this cannot be overemphasized, the screening. I always tell my patients that I will never ask why they need an STI or sexually transmitted infection workup. I always ask why don't they need one? As long as a woman is sexually active or young girl or even an older woman, it's very important to do these screening tests. So in medicine, we always talk about taking a good history and almost as important as personal medical history is family history. For those women who are fortunate enough to have access to and knowledge of their family history and tree, it is important to share that information with their OBGYN physician. There might be something in the history of both a female and male relative that can negatively impact the health of a woman, especially during pregnancy. So we want to be able to en enhance the care and safety of women during pregnancy and knowing the family history can be an essential part of this. There are such conditions such as bleeding and clotting disorders, preeclampsia history in family members and congenital defects such as being born with a heart defect and hereditary genetic conditions all of which should be known and can be evaluated before pregnancy for many women. So now I would like to focus on aspects of women's life that may not be as basic as some of the things I just mentioned. I am often the only physician that many women of reproductive care see, and I'm providing some or all of the primary care to many women. So it's important that there are some aspects of the care that I focus on, such as blood pressure monitoring, screening for diabetes at times, looking for anemia um, before pregnancy. So doing what we call a complete blood count. And it's important that I go through other aspects of their care, such as um, you know, thyroid function, for, for instance, when that's appropriate. And of course, other essential things such as breast care and disease. At times, preconception counseling not only includes my input as a general OBGYN, but also that from other specialists. We have specialists such as maternal fetal medicine specialists, hematologist, endocrinologist, cardiologist, psychiatrist, rheumatologist, and all of whom are important in some cases, depending on women's history, in achieving what needs to be achieved for women to optimize her health and care prior to pregnancy and of course as well during pregnancy. And these all these specialists are avail available here at Northwell Health. 
So what conditions should a woman, especially one of reproductive age, focus on prior to conceiving? So I'll start with the big one that, you know, always gets media attention, obesity. So in the United States, a quarter of the women, of women, about 26% between the age of 20 to 39 years of age are overweight. And unfortunately that number is higher where a third, about 29% are obese. These women, unfortunately, are more um, likely to have difficulty with conception because of insulin resistance and, and uh, failure to have regular menses. And their risk for such conditions is diabetes, gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that occurs during pregnancy, and hypertension. Many may have um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as miscarriages, multiple miscarriages, um, big babies, which we call macrosomia, or actually even the opposite is true, where you can have intrauterine growth restriction or baby who doesn't meet his or her growth potential in utero, in the uterus. Obesity can also lead to increased risk for congenital anomalies, so um, defects um, from the before the baby's born, stillbirths, preeclampsia and eclampsia, hypertension sensitive disorders in pregnancy that can be life-threatening to both mom and baby. And women who are obese are also more likely to require a cesarean birth or delivery. And I know how difficult it is for many to optimize their weight and to lose weight. And unfortunately, um, not all will have resources and assistance. However, it's important, it cannot be overemphasized the importance of some weight reduction prior to pregnancy. We know that any weight loss could be beneficial for a woman. So women are encouraged to maximize their weight loss prior to pregnancy. Now there is the exact opposite end of the spectrum, which is low pre-pregnancy -pre weight or women being underweight. That's the other extreme. And that can also be associated with adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes. So the ideal is optimal weight and not for women to be underweight. Uh, that should not be the goal. So I'd like to turn to another area, which is diabetes. Unfortunately, diabetes also plagues women even of reproductive age. It's not just an a, a, di a, a diagnosis that we see in our older menopausal women. We see type one diabetes and type two diabetes and preconception identification of diabetes and the control of diabetes prior to pregnancy is essential. Achieving and maintaining excellent glycemic or sugar control is very important. So screening, monitoring, and certain interventions for maternal medical complications that are associated with diabetes such as um, retinopathy, nephrop nephropathy, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, these are important prior to pregnancy. The overall risk for congenital malformations, so malformations of the fetus, is consistently reported to be two to fourfold higher for those women who have diabetes than for those without diabetes. And it is strongly related to the degree of hyperglycemia or sugar control in the preconceptual period. So this is why it's essential for there to be a focus on glycemic or sugar control to minimize these risks. The rates of miscarriage are also increased by about two to threefold for women who are pregnant and have pregestational or, or uh, before pregnancy diabetes than among those without diabetes. So again, maybe the assistance of a primary care physician such as internal medicine physician or and or endocrinologist 
with the assistance of maternal fetal medicine specialists and your OBGYN is important to ensure um, in optimization of your diabetes control prior to pregnancy. So the next condition I'd like to discuss is hypertension or high blood pressure. As mentioned before, often I am the only physician that a patient of reproductive age encounters. And therefore I pay close attention to such things as blood pressure and elevation of blood pressure. And although it takes more than one high reading of a blood pressure to diagnose hypertension, if a woman is considering pregnancy, especially, I automatically draw attention to any elevations of high blood pressure. And at that point, we'll refer her for continued monitoring, either at home or through her primary care physician, if she has one, or cardiologist even, depending on the level of hypertension. We here at Northwell also have an OB cardiology program that helps women with hypertension before pregnancy, during, and after because of the importance of controlling blood pressure and how it can affect a woman's health. And we know that hypertension in pregnancy can lead to preeclampsia during pregnancy, which again can have negative impacts on both mom and baby. There are other common conditions which include asthma and thyroid conditions. And what's important about these is that the optimization of medicine and medication and control can be very important, especially given specifically conditions such as thyroid uh, disease that may affect fertility, miscarriage rates, and pregnancy outcomes for both mom and baby. I'd like to also mention that, you know, equally important and impactful for many women is mental health. It's important to realize that, you know, family history can play a role, past history can play a role regarding mental health and st stability. So it's something that I really routinely evaluate and screen for any concerns or condition a woman has prior to pregnancy regarding her mental health so that we can really ensure as, as, as safe and, and comfortable a pregnancy for a woman. Social health. So I mentioned that because, um, you know, there's other aspects such as um, cigarette smoking, smoking of other um, uh, products and illicit drug use that we know, even if you were to just decrease, can minimize risk to both mom and baby. But it is important to realize that from smoking to some illicit drugs to alcohol, these substances can have teratogenic or again, um, effects that can impact the malformation of risk to the baby. So it's important to pay attention to that. And of course, there's other aspects such as adequate sleep and decreasing stress. And I wish it was a pill or something that we can give for that, but there definitely needs to be a focus for a woman in regards to that to enhance her health. I mentioned a bit about breast health and uh, screening. And I, I think what, what is very important, we know that um, breast awareness, um, clinical breast exams, when appropriate at appropriate ages are important to um, help a woman maintain good breast health. And but what's important is that many women have delayed their um, pregnancy or, or reproduction until older ages, maybe late thirties into the forties. And I always mention to these women that it's important to know when routine breast cancer screening should start and that perhaps there may be an indication for routine screening prior to pregnancy, depending on age, personal and family history. Um, and I also appreciate um, that every patient and family that comes to me with fertility concerns, I'm often the first stop for that, um, that everyone who comes by the time they make it to my office, that 
They really wanted a baby yesterday. I appreciate, and I explained to them, the, the patient and family, that there are several competent and talented and brilliant reproductive endocrinologists within our system that very often I will have to refer to them to get to achieve that pregnancy goal. Their expertise is very necessary in many cases. And as the OBGYN, there are certain things that I can offer prior to referral to the reproductive endocrinologist. There is basic infertility evaluation, such as ovarian reserve markers, which is a, a, a blood test basically, um, semen, semen analysis for the partners, if one is available. Um, hysterosalpingogram, which is a long word for basically doing a dye test to evaluate the fallopian tube patency and, and ensure that um, they're, they're patent and open. And advising, monitoring, and documentation of the ovulation process, uh, and also discussing what timed intercourse is. So oftentimes, that this is my role that I play, um, but very often, um, we, we are, we're not exactly sure why we can't achieve pregnancy, but it is important to realize the important role that our reproductive endocrinologists play. I think it's important to always connect with my colleagues who are reproductive endocrinologists and infertility specialists. We have several within our Northwell system who are very brilliant, and caring and compassionate and very talented in helping to achieve the goals of pregnancy for a woman and her family. I think it's important that we listen to Dr. Noyer's uh, presentation as she will speak on so many advances that have occurred um, through the years and through the decades and through her extensive experience with reproductive endocrinology. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Nicole Noyes and I'm the system chief of reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Northwell Health. And I'm honored to be part of the Northwell family. Uh, that was a hard act to follow with Dr. Hippolyte and she gave a very nice introduction to the overall importance of health, all aspects of health at all times in a person's life from puberty into advanced age and especially when carrying pregnancy. If you think of all the efforts required to raise children once born, the body has a tremendous responsibility in providing a home for a growing and developing fetus. Well, overlay on that choices, people electively or non-electively having to make choices about parenthood, when, how, with whom. And honestly, with the advent of easy birth control beginning in the 1960s, the birth control pill, uh, people call it the largest sociologic experiment, but it was largely popularized in the 70s and 80s. And with that came a major transition in reproductive trends and practices um, with people having less children and having them over. So that over the past 50 years, the overall birth rate has declined tremendously with the current birth rate now at that of the Great Depression. Well, there's still a lot of children being born. In fact, about 3.7 million a year, so that's a lot, but it's a 30 year low. If you think of it in relative terms, in 1990, there were 115 pregnancies per thousand women. And today there are 58 pregnancies per thousand women. So it's really gone down. And not only are people having less children, they're postponing the creation of family to a later age. The average age of first birth in the United States is age 27. Think of that. A person with ovaries becomes fertile at about 12 or 13 if they start ovulating then and having their period. And their fertility peak is actually 13 to 30. Yet we wait until 27 or beyond in many cases to start having a family. Well, I personally think this is a design flaw. I would have made people with ovaries more fertile from 25 to 45, but no one asked me. So. Why are we bucking biology uh, by more than a decade in favor of other things, life experiences, needing to make more money first, finding the right partner with whom to parent? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but um, you know, the bottom line is around the world in industrialized countries, people are waiting to have children. And the last interesting point on that same topic is that 
the only pregnancy rate rises in the United States are in women aged 35 to 39 and 40 to 44 beyond reproductive prime. So layer on to that, that when people do go to try, they've been trying, you know, a couple of months and they say, oh, the problem. So 12% of US women suffer from infertility overall. So that's how they end up in my office or in Dr. Hippolyte's office, um, looking for assistance in conception. And when they come, you know, sometimes patients come with a full workup done. It really depends on the physician or the patient. And some people come with nothing. And wherever they are, that's where I meet them. So like Dr. Hippolyte said, one of the key things is checking for ovulation. We can either monitor their ovaries with an ultrasound. We can monitor some blood tests. They can do ovulation kits at home. There's a lot of different ways to check for ovulation, but basically if a woman has a regular cycle about every 26 to 35 days, most often they're ovulating. And the women who have less regular periods, like maybe 45 or 60 days or a couple times a year, tend not to be ovulating or what we call oligo ovulators or not ovulating very much. Um, we always check the uterus cavity. Either we do a hysterosalpingogram like Dr. Hippolyte pointed out, or sometimes we do a 3D saline sonogram. We have a nice machine in our office where we can do that in lieu of the x-ray. And we're looking for things like fibroids or polyps or scar tissue, or sometimes people have one-off issues where there's a congenital anomaly of their uterus. Um, and many of these things are uh, repairable or removable, depending on what the issue is. Uh, we also check to see that the fallopian tubes are open, either with a histogram or sometimes we use this uh, special kind of saline sonogram. And if there's a partner, we check for sperm quality. Sometimes people are using uh, a banked sperm. It, it's, you know, all over the map today. And um, every time we see the patient for a new evaluation, we, we do a pelvic ultrasound and we're looking for all kinds of things, not just how the uterus looks. Um, we're looking for ovarian cysts, say maybe it will suggest endometriosis or maybe there's scar tissue. Uh, we can see things are displaced and, and um, get some ideas about what's going on. And last, again, like Dr. Hippolyte pointed out, we'll do a hormone evaluation. And this will involve any of the key organs that might impact reproduction, like the thyroid. Sometimes people's thyroid is off, or sometimes they have a small tumor in their pituitary gland secreting a hormone called prolactin, or maybe the hypothalamus didn't develop correctly, and we can sort of see the, the, the uh, after of that. We will um, do a broad sweep evaluation of the ovarian function with baseline ovarian reserve testing, the anti-malarian hormone or AMH, or a baseline FSH level at the beginning of their cycle, FSH follicle stimulating hormone. And all of this can be done by an experienced gynecologist or by a specialist like myself, but wherever the patient is on their journey, that's where I pick up. And today I saw six patients this morning and they were all at various stages. Some people came with things, some people didn't. And you just start from where they are. Anyway, so a person attempting pregnancy should obviously always try, try to achieve optimal health. And um, there are lots of women in New York who really try to be perfect about their health. In fact, one point that Dr. Hippolyte brought up is some people are underweight because they're over exercising or under eating to try to, to uh, maintain what they feel is a perfect weight. So I see people a lot in New York who are undernourished. I also see a lot that are overnourished or have baseline obesity or have polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's a big one in, in um, women and a lot in New York City. So a lot of women have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the ovaries are putting out a little bit more hormone than they should and it just basically creates a hormone imbalance within the, the reproductive system. And oftentimes it will present as not ovulating, but there are other key uh, issues that can be associated with PCOS, which again, Dr. Hippolyte highlighted, which they can have obesity because of it, diabetes, sometimes heart disease or high blood pressure. So these patients require all, you know, a complete assessment, particularly when we see the ovaries have polycystic uh, ovarian disease on pelvic ultrasound. Well, at Northwell Health Fertility, we really care about the whole person. And so when I came to um, 
Northwell from another institution in the city, um, I had a fellow that was gung-ho, fellow S actually, Dr. Stephanie Brownridge, who was a Lennox Hill resident before uh, starting the fellowship. And, and she was keenly involved, at, uh, interested as was I to start a comprehensive care program. So we aligned with a specific group of Northwell specialists in all the relevant disciplines to uh, reproductive health. So a high risk OB, an endocrinologist, nutritionist, and importantly, psych psychologist and psychiatrist. Um, to make sure mental health is in line, and sometimes even a cardiologist if there's any kind of uh, blood pressure or cardiac disease. And so with the help of Dr. Brownridge, we got this program formalized, and um, we've already treated over 200 patients uh, in the program, and we have regular meetings and discuss the patients, and the program is really rapidly uh, growing. And one thing that's helped it to grow is this new emphasis on telemed. So before, when you would say to a patient at the end of the consult, and by the way, I want you to see a high-risk OB and an endocrinologist and a nutritionist, uh, maybe they'd go to one of those people. And now with telemed and my assistant actually scheduling those visits, um, when the actual cause of fertility is something more than, than ovulation, so if it's just ovulation, oftentimes um, we'll give a fertility pill. People know Clomid or Letrozole. There's a couple of different pills that we use to try to uh, trick the ovulation into happening, and it works a lot of the time. But if the actual cause of infertility is more complex than just the egg not being released, like for instance, the sperm is markedly low in, and it looks like it doesn't have meat criteria to be able to fertilize an egg, or the fallopian tubes that collect, uh, actually, sorry, connect the uterus to the um, ovaries, uh, might be damaged, maybe from endometriosis or an infection, or, um, you know, one of the big things we see is advanced maternal age. So women, as I said, they're most fertile from 13 to 30, but they show up at 38 or 40 or 41 and say, I'm ready to have a baby. Um, in these situations where it's more complex, because in vitro fertilization is so successful today, it's really about 50-50 every time you put an embryo into someone um, that's a good quality embryo, uh, we often will resort to in vitro fertilization as the next step. So in the course of in vitro fertilization, fertility medications are given to a patient and these are administered subcutaneously, meaning under the skin. So that's a little bit annoying. And it's also annoying that you have to come in and get monitored. So a patient has to come in five or six times in 12 days to see how the the uh, ovaries are responding to the medication, but once the eggs are ready, they're removed from the body, they're gently aspirated out of the ovaries uh, under a, a light sedation, and they're placed in a dish, and they're exposed to sperm, sometimes just adding sperm to the dish, sometimes doing a special procedure to, to coax the fertilization to happen, and then they're under this special media that uh, um, provides the nutrition the embryos need to develop. And these embryos are then placed in an incubator, a very specialized incubator. It's like cooking a souffle. I, I can cook a souffle actually. And I know that it takes very precise timing and right temperature, and that's what has to happen in an incubator. And we have these special incubators at Northwell that actually take pictures every 20 minutes and turn those pictures into a movie so that when you come in in the morning, you can see everything that the embryo has done. And that's very important to see all these subtle details in the embryo. It's kind of like if you had a camera above your child in the crib or above your teenager when they're out with their friends at a party and showing you everything they did. The truth is that subtle developmental changes we see over the course of five days can help us to select the best embryo for use. Uh, today, IVF has a lot of exciting add-on technologies. Um, it's ever advancing. It's all trying to help you pick the right embryo. For instance, when someone has a genetic disorder or carries a genetic defect for something, say cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs, or even has a genetic predisposition for a disease such as breast cancer, the BRCA gene or breast cancer gene, um, there is a technology where you can take a tiny biopsy of the embryo and that biopsy tissue can be sent to a lab to be tested while the embryo is safely cryopreserved and we wait for the results. This is called pre-implantation genetic testing, PGT, meaning we're testing the embryo before we're putting it back into the uterus. And it's all very exciting. And while some of it has a way to go, it's made huge strides in the last 20 years and has helped a lot of people to have a healthy child.
And last, given the overwhelming social trend to delay childbearing, what has become very popular today is for people to undergo the beginning stages of IVF, where the ovaries are stimulated to mature multiple eggs, and the eggs are then removed from the ovaries, the egg retrieval, and then they're either frozen, unfertilized, egg freezing, or placed with sperm and fertilized and frozen as embryos, embryo banking. That way, someone can use their younger eggs to create family at an older age. And this is very popular today. And many people who are on a rigorous path, say to law school or med school or starting a new business or haven't found the partner with whom they want to co-parent are doing this. And in fact, um, a lot of patients are sent to me who are newly diagnosed with cancer who may receive a treatment that will render them sterile. For instance, uh, an early breast cancer or lymphoma or uh, I've seen bone tumors and leukemias. I've seen all kinds of patients that are young and I'm able to freeze eggs before they receive their treatment that will hurt the ovaries. And that's very exciting. Um, I had a patient that froze her eggs at 38 in my last job. So it was about a decade, a little more than a decade ago. And she met the man of her dreams at age 49 and delivered her baby at age 51. And you may say, oh, 51, but actually our governing body, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, feels it's safe to have children until age 55. So that's the cutoff we use in our clinic. When I called this patient after she delivered and asked her how she was doing, I was a little afraid. And she said, I couldn't be happier. So it was a game changer for her. It was a wonderful positive. And she took the step to freeze at 38 and was able to have a child at 51. I think today one message is we have to learn not to judge reproductive pra practices or what constitutes family, but to embrace all people trying to create a loving family. Um, I think just in closing, I wanna say that the overall birth rate using frozen eggs or embryos or things we have in the freezer is about one in three. Um, I've been at this for 30 years and I've been freezing eggs for 17 years. So I have a lot of experience and the key thing we've learned is the younger the freezing, the higher the chance of pregnancy when you use that tissue later. So if you freeze at say 25, uh, you're gonna do a lot better than say if you freeze at 38. Some people are pushing to have people freeze at an even younger age, say 21 or 22, sending them a Facebook ad. You know, there's a lot of private equity in this now and you know, people see there's money to be made. I personally don't think someone needs to freeze that young. I think choosing to freeze at say, closer to 30, 28 to 30 is a very reasonable thing to do. Because I think at that age, you kind of see where your life is going. Are you gonna to go to get a second degree? Are you in a relationship conducive to childbearing? Or do you see a long path before you're gonna be a parent? And if you see a long path, it's not a crazy idea to freeze. So I hope I've helped to provide an overview of where human reproductive trends are today and the exciting advances available to reproductive age people. I again feel grateful to be able to lead the Northwell Health Fertility Group to provide the best and most state-of-the-art treatments available while caring for the whole person. Thank you.